that's the first thing you do. You learn from the previous predecessors. So holding the mic is the approach we're going to take this morning. Good morning. If I don't hear that good morning, we're not getting anywhere. So good morning. Come on, we've got breakfast out there. So good morning. We've got to be positive, man. We're the last continent on this earth. So we've got to be excited about, you know, being the cradle of mankind. So I'm going to try this once more. Good morning. Ah, there we go. Thank you. So good morning to those that are here and those that we have online. Everyone, um, I've been introduced. My name is Fatima Ali Mohammed. Um, and there is a slide that is supposed to be coming up. So the technical guys, if you could put that slide up. Um, I'm going to say all protocols um, observed and I'm glad to see my friend Ama here and Raj, um, two people that um, I know drive what we talk about positivity and wanting to do things on the continent. Um, this morning, I'm not going to be sharing things like data, GDP, or how many people we have in the labor force, what is it that we do. We all know this information. And anyone who's ever listened to me before will know that I use the word NATO a lot, which is a United Nations, you know, council. But my, for me, NATO stands for no action, talk only. And I really don't like to go into places where all we do is talk, talk, talk and come out with nothing. So when you come into events like what Ishmael Yamshan has, we know that we are trying to provoke with trying to be thought provokers. And this is something that I said yesterday on one of the radio stations, and I'm hoping that the media that are going to be here today will also be the first change makers because I feel we need to stop giving politicians front page. We need to stop talking about all the issues and the negativity that is going on. There is just so much positivity that we have. There's so much that's happening on this continent that we haven't even scratched the surface to be able to share. So I think the media should take an oath and say from today, we are not going to be sharing anything to do with politics and all the negativities. Let's start showcasing successful agriculture businesses that are happening in this country, on this continent. Let us start showcasing that. So this is something that anyone has an opportunity. And I'm just going to put it up there because I just want us to keep referring to this. only one slide. I prefer to talk than doing presentations. And the reason I'm sharing this slide is I just want to show you the opportunities that exist. Okay? This is just in one year. In one year, we've had 280 agri-tech ventures on the continent. If you look at Ghana alone, there's been over 30 projects that have been funded. If we tell you that there has been $280 million that has just been put in venture capital in the agri space, I'm not even talking about clean cooking or I'm not talking about ICT, I'm not talking about the health sector, I'm just talking about agri. No one has captured this information. Or and this is information that is free and available. If anyone wants to get this data, please go to, it's Britta Bridges. They're online. They are a thought leadership research um, company. And they will share every data that you need on all sectors. It gives you an informed position. One of the things that I say to people is that if you want to know what's happening on the ground, you first need to know what's happening globally so that you can then pull that. It's called being able to steal ideas shamelessly. If we want AvTech to work, then we need to make sure that we have learned the failures of Brexit so that we do not need to reinvent the wheel. Okay? So I'm going to start with an analogy this morning. I told you I'm a very interesting person. I don't want to talk about farming and cocoa, you know, and cassava. We all know that we're the world leaders in cocoa. We know we're the third in cassava. We know we import 3.2 million kgs of meat in a month. We know that we import 950,000 tons of rice. How does that information help you? I'd rather just look at what are the opportunities and what is it that we can do. So I'm going to start with an analogy here of the lion and the elephant. In the jungle, it is said, the elephant is the biggest, 
the giraffe is the tallest, the fox is the wisest, and the cheetah is the fastest. But the lion is still the king of the jungle, yet he doesn't have any of these qualities. Why? It is because the lion is courageous, he is bold, he walks with confidence, and he dares anything and is never afraid. The lion is a risk taker and is unstoppable. The lion believes any food is food for him. The lion believes any opportunity is worth giving it a trial and never lets it slip from its hands. Funny enough, the lion only walk, works for four hours, but he eats meat and he sleeps for 20 hours. The elephant, on the other hand, works for 24 hours, but only eats grass. So my question to all of us here, is Ghana a lion or an elephant? We have gone out for the 17th time to beg for a loan. We didn't learn the 14th, the 15th, the 16th time, and I have a feeling we're probably not going to learn the 17th time either. So I'm not sure, does that make us an elephant? The moral of the story is we need to have the courage, the will to try, the faith to believe that everything is possible. The strategy is our approach to challenges, circumstances and situations. Always stay in lion mode. As I speak today, I will keep making reference to Africa rather than Ghana as a country, as it's time we started seeing the opportunities on a continental level than just as one nation. Our role individually has an impact on the collective. The conversations we're having is about the Ghana agribusiness opportunity, the African opportunity, which is staring us right here. The African opportunity is real and true. The African agripreneurs, innovators, and exporters must prioritize ourselves as more critical to changing the African narratives above politicians and political parties. We must accept to be driven by a deeper purpose and a clear ideology of what is transferable. We must see the challenges that are facing us as a continent not as barriers, but only as human issues we're more than capable of resolving. For entrepreneurs, innovators, and exporters ready to solve problems and innovate to see Africa's unmet needs, there's a tremendous opportunity for transformation. Change has always been driven by human hearts and heads who move ideas and services across the globe. These change makers are in this room and online and everywhere else. And while we work with the world, we need to look at the possibilities that are exciting, that we can birth for our own people. I know I'm standing in front of you looking like an Obruni, but hey, let me just tell you, I am an African to the core and a very, very proud Kenyan and a Pan-Africanist. Africa was defeated by slave trade and colonialism. The weapon, and there we go. The weapon used to achieve this feat at that time was the gunpowder a weapon that is no longer recognized into We have a false notion as Africans and a narrative of our unprogressiveness. We're so negative about everything. Unfortunately, colonization of the mind continues. So we may think we're not colonized, but we are colonized by the mind. And that is why we're not using our mind and senses to think at the highest level of what possibilities is there to confront challenges of everyday life. The opportunity lies within the problems we see and face daily. Africa is the richest continent, yet its people are poor. But the rest of the world thinks Africa is poor. We need to change that. Africa is the richest. It's it's people are poor. So we need to understand and let that sink in. It is not the external world that is causing us our problem. It's we ourselves as Africans that are doing it to ourselves. 
And this is one example I keep mentioning for all those that remember that what happened, whatever was happening in South Africa, the whole cleansing, the ethnic cleansing was not a foreigner doing it. It was we Africans against Africans. So it is time that we change this mindset and understand that if we want to do anything for the agri sector, if we need to toil the land, it is we doing for our own. As Ghanaians and as Africans, we must seek knowledge and focus our eyes and ears on understanding the global trends. And this is where I feel we sell ourselves very short. We do not know the threats that are happening globally and the impact that they have on us. For example, how many in this room and those that are online are aware of the new European legislation that is coming into play? which says they will no longer be buying anything out of Africa that does not have traceability. Now we know how our systems work. We'll have Kwame come and deliver two sacks of cocoa. We're going to have uh, Yeboah come and bring in five sacks of cocoa. We don't know where they get it from. Everybody just picks, comes, puts it into a place and sells. Now if Europe is saying that until you do not showcase traceability, we're not going to be lifting, whether it's cocoa or whoever else. Should we be crying and thinking that we're going to lose this market? Have we even thought or put in strategies of what we're going to do to mitigate this issue? The first thing we need to look at is we are a population of 1.42 billion people. If I divided that into 50%, we say, let's take 700 million people and say, okay, this 700 million people are living under a dollar a day. So you know what? Let's t target another 50% of that. 350 million people. Are you saying on this continent, we cannot make sure that just one person for breakfast has one cup of cocoa? That's 350 million cups of cocoa. It's a paradigm shift. But I can promise you, we're going to sit here, we're going to reach the time that it happens, and we're going to go, we're stuck. We do not know what to do with this cocoa. So we need to start understanding the opportunities are there. How are we taking advantage of the continental free trade to be able to say, right now, which country has a strength in which area and which country has a weakness. If Ghana is the largest producer of cocoa with Ivory Coast, why can't we take it to East Africa, to Kenya, to Ethiopia to do the production? If something is happening that Kenya can be able to do and Kenya is not great at yams and cassava, what is it that we can do with Ghana? Has anyone sat there and said, let's look at a SWOT analysis and how we can be able to leverage within our own. The problem we have as Africans is we're all sitting and waiting with a sit and watch approach to see who is going to be first to do this. That is our problem. So we need to call a spade a spade and not a big spoon. The reality is that we don't want to see our neighbors successful. The next challenge we have for the continental free trade, especially on the agri sector and more so in any other area, is jobs. Have we set and thought when we're saying every African is going to be able to have the right to move across borders under the continental free trade, what does that mean? I'm a Kenyan, I'm here, I've been here for 13 years. I can tell you if you go into all the hotels, including the hotel that we're sitting in today, is being managed by Kenyans. Okay, if a Nigerian is going to come here and start being able to sell chichinga on the streets, wahala day. Okay, Nigerians are already in Kenya. So are we already understanding that the role this is going to play in terms of insecurity because everyone's going to be hungry. Everybody is going to take the skills that they have to be able to push and drive the agenda. So we need to start thinking in a collaborative approach because Africa has land, sun, water, and people. So we need to leverage that from the agri sector and say, what is it that we can do to be able to look at your strength and me taking advantage of it? That's the only way we can do this. The other area that we have is this 
whole exportation of raw material. We have sung about it, we've talked about it. I mean, I'm, I'm reading newspapers and getting scared that when we say all of a sudden now lands are going to belong to China, you know, ports in Djibouti is already belonging to China. I mean, really, what did we do wrong? What did we do wrong not to understand that the land that is supposed to be producing maize, our staples, things that you can just wake up in the morning and know you can go and have millet and have it as porridge, get your chicken to produce egg, have an amazing omelette, huh? be able to have your vegetables produced for you and take the rest to the market, but we'd rather continue to import tomatoes from Burkina Faso and onions and reach a point like when COVID happened where one kg of onions was more expensive than one liter of petrol. Who is responsible for this? It's not the American or the European or the Chinese. We are fully responsible for it. The other area that we need to look at, because I know I'm only supposed to have 10 minutes in this, is supply chain. We're talking about the continental free trade. Infrastructure is a key aspect. My friends, only 7% of Ghanaians have access to sanitation, to a toilet. And we're already seeing articles talking about we putting one of the fastest train and you know, building the other port and that. We're not dealing with the basics. Has anyone calculated what it means to be able to move produce to the Ghana port, then to South Africa, then to Nigeria? If anybody understands how logistics works, it works based on the water draft. So which ship is going to come, with what weight, where is it going to go? So where is the economics of scales? Cancer used to be a disease for the rich just the way HIV was. You would never have heard of cancer in Africa, and more so in West Africa. West Africans don't smoke. Go to Kolebu, find out how many people, read the newspapers every day dying of breast cancer, prostate cancer, something or the other with cancer. Where do you think that is coming from? It's because we continue to be a 90% import-based country. How can we, Africans who are running around in our childhood with chicken, chasing goats, import 3.2 million kgs of meat, which takes 60 days to get here. It gets frosted, defrosted on the high seas by the time it gets to you. There is no freezer that is taking care of it at the port. By the time it goes to Nima and Medina, what do you think you're eating? We just need to ask ourselves of the hard questions in this agri sector. I'm sorry, but it's just painful to sit there and think that we're going to moan and moan and moan, and these are things that we can take into our hands and be able to deal with it. The European Union, again, have approved insects as a base of food. Has anybody in the agri sector seen that as an opportunity? In Uganda, they love picking rain flies. When it rains, Chale, you should see how those kids go for those rain flies. Hardcore protein. Go to Kumasi. I have a friend who's running a project at the Kwame Nkrumah University, doing the same thing. She's now taking insects, producing it, producing shito out of it, producing cookies out of it, producing flour from it. Opportunities, if we're not going to eat it, somebody out there feels they want to become a vegan, there's opportunity. We're sitting and still not looking at all these little things that can be able to be done for us. Now, most importantly, let's just talk about simple things. How many of you eat Kofi Brookman? That was my favorite dish when I came here. I love Aha. Uh -huh. I love Kofi Brookman, man. If there was one thing I would take with me anywhere in the world, it's Kofi Brookman. For those who don't know, it's the banana you eat on the street. I keep telling people, you know this confusion, oh my God, Africa is dirty and da da da. Did you know when you eat the maize on the street or the cassava or the Kofi Brookman, it's on charcoal. It's taken through heat. There is nothing. During COVID, I ate it because by the time you're putting that thing on fire, every disease you can think of is gone. Okay? Now, let me tell you, did you know that 
If you go online and look for a patent now called Banana Tex, it's a patent made for banana fiber leather. Go on your phone. Here we're eating coffee broke, man. We throw the damn thing. It blocks our gutter. Nobody's coming to clean it. But somebody somewhere has decided, I'm going to take those bananas. I'm going to convert it into leather. And go on your phones. You all have smartphones. Go and check the price of a banana leather jacket from Louis Vuitton. $7,000. Hey, Charlie, Kwame, where are you? Can you imagine what we can do? Now go and look for another brand, another patent called Pinatex. Pineapple. Pineapple leather. Go and find out the price of a pineapple leather jacket by Gucci. 9,000 euros. Hey, Masa. I'm, I don't even think I see that kind of money in a year. Do you see what I'm trying to say? That the opportunities are there. And I'm trying to link this back to understanding global trends because global trends have an impact. The whole world needs food, the whole world needs medicines, the whole world needs shelter. So you can never go wrong in these three areas. And now with connectivity, and my sister Rashida is going to come and tell you, we're going to be getting into an even more dangerous world with artificial intelligence. You know? Our challenge on the continent, and especially in Ghana, Ama and I work on a project in Volta. And it's sad that we're trying to put up a farm school and how the youth do not want to be a part of it. Why? Because agriculture is not sexy. They don't find it sexy. They feel, why should I get my hands dirty? I will continue to remain poor. But guess what? Everybody needs food on their table. And the only person that can provide that is the farmer. So what we need to do is, is merge technology, which is what the youth understand, and bring in the agri part of it and let them use technology to modernize agriculture and be able to do creative things that gives them the opportunity to take us forward. We can't continue to remain a country where two hectares is the size of the farmland of a farmer. A government employee can go to work at 8 in the morning, leave at 5 in the evening, and read the newspaper from 8 to 11, and still get paid a salary. The farmer has no guarantee of an income at the end of the day, because chances are he didn't have a truck to take his goods to the market, or it rained, or there was post-harvest losses, and he's not able to feed himself and his family. This is where I say, shame on us. And we need to have these hard, hard questions. We need to have these hard, hard conversations. The answers are there. That's why I said I don't want to stand in front of you and talk to you about the percentages of everything. So what? So what? How does it help you to know how much we've imported? How, much, how does it help you if we say the agri sector is employing this kind of people? What we need to understand is that the opportunity for anything is in agri. Today, if we look at the oil palm industry, I don't know how many of you are aware that everything that you consume, from your toothpaste to your shampoo to your soap to your lipstick to your margarine to your pharmaceutical is all made from oil palm. Nothing goes to waste in oil palm. Yet, Today, Ghana produces four, imports 480,000 tons of oil palm for a market that only needs 260,000 tons. And yet, the first tree of oil palm was in West Africa, but we took it and we went and gave it to Malaysia and Indonesia, who became the world's largest exporter. So my friends, this is my plea. Let's change the narrative. Let's start showcasing successful agri projects that are happening on this continent. There is so much that is happening. I need us to move away from the negativity mode and look at the potential that exists. We can be the cure for the world. Three tablespoons of just red oil palm has been showcased to bring CD4 counts of HIV patients to the highest level. 
We need to think differently. We need to do things differently. There's fish leather, there's coconut leather, there is pineapple leather, there's banana leather. I mean, there is just so much that we can do. But we need to move away from this aspect of fear. We need to move away from this African mindset that we have, that why are you doing better and I'm not? We need to move into collaboration. And going back to my analogy, it is time we recognize that we are the lions of the jungle. We need to get into beast mode. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fatima. So much to chew on and so many decisions to make either from the financing side or from the innovation side to be able to kickstart what we haven't done in so many years as a country. Fatima, I'd like to just give you some extra information and I, I, we got talking about that yesterday. We run an organization that currently has close to 1,800 female-led businesses across 36 African countries. And I can tell you that from the pharmaceutical to agri sector, all these women are doing about 90% from these two sectors only. One of their biggest challenges is that they are doing the production, but quite a lot of them are doing the same thing. So innovation is a challenge. And quite a number of them have challenges with access to market. So that is another area which um, has to be dealt with. So yes, people are doing interesting things. Currently, I see honey being put in a, in a, in a sachet like the margarine, and then you can push and have a bit of honey and not buy the whole thing if you cannot afford it. And I find that quite innovative. So we need to put really our thinking caps on when it comes to areas of innovation. And of course, agriculture is, could be safe if we're actually doing the last leg of things in relation to processing, then that is guaranteed. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are receiving some messages that we have challenges with our online, um, the sound. And so we will quickly do some, um, we asked you to share with us your business cards and so we will shuffle it and then give you a gift. And then we will open the floor for questions. I mean, um, Fatima is here to answer any questions. She, she does fantastic on AGI as well. And so um, I'm sure she'll be open to have some questions come through whilst um, that particular problem is solved because people are sending messages to say, Odelia, this is something we should all be enjoying um, online. And so we want to be able to use the opportunity to resolve the, the challenge, yes. So have you found someone? Or can we get somebody come to choose? Yeah. And I hope it's not anybody from your company. No. Great. All right, so we have Stella Dosu, um, and she comes from Therasis Clinic. Sarah, are you here? Can you just give us a wave? Okay, so today you're going to be going away with about six bottles of Locusade to energize you whilst you, you drive back from here. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So Fatima, one of the things that beats my imagination as a journalist, a practicing journalist, has always been that, how did we as a country get to cocoa syndicated loans? 
when Coco is here, you go set, you pick the money, you come back to your country. And for us as a nation, we have come thus far, sold Coco bags and tons to various countries. What haven't we gotten right for which we have to start work from today? Um, Injero got some good money from um, VC to support the um, agri sector. Um, I think that was about 20 million um, Ghana cities, as what I, I read recently. And it's supposed to support the SME sector. Is that, the, is that going to be the game changer? Um, sorry. So first and foremost, it's very interesting that you brought up about the SMEs, and this is something that, you know, Scale Up Africa and myself tend to talk about a lot. First and foremost, I want to bring it to, before I answer the question on the cocoa front, the continental free trade is not for everyone. The continental free trade is actually for the big boys, the big companies, and this is what I keep saying because you have to have an export license, you have to be able to have the capital um, to be able to do that. But while we say that, the actual feeders to those companies are the SMEs. My problem is big companies don't know about the continental free trade. And if they don't know what the continental free trade is all about, how do we expect the SMEs to know anything about it? So I feel, again, this is an area where media can play a big role in terms of educating and getting people to understand if tomorrow one of the shoe companies in Ghana who's producing 2,000 pairs of shoes in a day is given an order out of Ethiopia for 50,000 pairs of shoes, it's very easy to get SMEs who are currently producing to feed because 50 thousand means even if you're taking 30 SMEs, they're not going to get a license when they go to the, to the AFTEC office. So they are able to plug in, get paid by the source, and we create an opportunity. The continental free trade is also just a very nice name. We've already been trading. My God, if you go to the borders, we've already been doing continental free trade. So we've just taken it and labeled it you know, and, and put it there. But I think it's the biggest opportunity we have. And we have a lot of people who are out there as naysayers waiting for us to fail. Now, going to Coco, the question was, how did we get ourselves into that? See, the, the mic doesn't want me to say this. I just think it's poor financial management. Okay, that's just it. We have not managed it well. You can't be saying, and that's why I'm saying today, cocoa farmers, I don't know how many are aware of this, are actually moving away from cocoa farming and giving their lands to people to do galamse. And currently, some countries in the European Union have also raised concerns of some of the cocoa that is going to them that contains mercury. So we're already creating our problems for ourselves even before it gets to us. So it's purely, I mean, if we just look at the figure, you know, I'm not a mathematician, I failed in school in maths very badly. But if I just went on the assumption that we're talking about three billion, you know, from IMF, I think the cocoa farmers are owed 2.2 or 2.8 billion. So what does that say? I leave the rest to you. 